Well, today, here we are at our namesake, this old cinnabar mine. And right behind me is where the shaft used to be. It's kind of sloughed off now and covered it up, and maybe that's a good thing. But I brought out this old uh, jackleg drill that was used to, to uh, open up this old mine shaft way back in the day. Today, we're here to talk about Colt's iconic single-action army revolver. Now, we know that, that single-action armies were used a lot for, by law enforcement in the Old West. They were used a lot by private security because law enforcement was stretched pretty thin back in the day. So they were used a lot around old mines. And I don't know if this one was ever rich enough that it needed private security, but uh, you know, if you've collected single action armies or, or, or kind of watched them, you've probably seen some Mark Copper Queen mine out of Arizona. There's just a lot of them out there. That was a huge, huge mine. Um, had a lot of private security and used a lot of single action armies. So stick around today. We'll talk a little bit about Old West mining and we'll talk a whole lot about Colt's single action army. One of the things that we'll do, we'll, we'll have a little fun out here this morning and then uh, we'll go back to the shop and we'll show you some of the things to look for as far as issues that, that um, you can find with single action armies. Now most people know that a single action army should have four clicks, but there's a whole lot more to it. And some of the things are, are fairly easy. If you're at a gun show or a gun shop, um, there's, there's some things that you can look at that, that uh, We'll give you a clue if there's some issues with that revolver and, and whether to keep uh, bargaining or just walk away. So stick around. This ought to be a lot of fun and pretty informative as well. Okay, before we get started shooting, let's just take a quick little tour around and, and look at some of the old mine equipment that's, that's left over here. This was the crusher. You can probably see in the bottom there the, the jaws for that crusher. It would have been standing upright back in the day, but uh, a wildfire burned the, the wooden framework around it years ago, and it, it's over on its side now. They must have used a lot of water in the process because there was two or three of these big water tanks here at one time. We've taken some of them and uh, used them in other places for stock water and whatnot. We'll keep walking over here. Now, this would have been the, about where the mouth of the mine used to be. And uh, years after the mine was closed, somebody else come up and was going to open it up and they bulldozed off a whole lot of the face. But here's some of the ore out of the mine. Now, now cinnabar is a beautiful dark red crystal and it's, and it's in this ore. You can see it under microscope and whatnot. Or if you crush it and pan it like gold, um, you get this beautiful red line of, of crushed um, little red crystals. The, the white color there is actually barium which is that really tasty shake they have you drink before you get an internal x-ray because uh, x-rays don't go through barium. So we'll wa wander over here and the brush has grown up through it a bunch now but back in this brush there's what we call a retort and that's where they would heat up the ore and get the liquid um, mercury out of the cinnabar. And you can see these bricks down here and some of this steel frame over here. This was where, where they retorted out that mercury from the cinnabar. Now, this mine was really active during the Depression. You know, the, the cattle prices were terrible. Horse prices were terrible. It was really hard to make a living. So well, the ranchers um, that, that uh, homesteaded this place turned to this mine to get through the depression. So it's really a kind of an interesting part of our history here on the Cinnabar. Well, okay, we can't head back inside without doing a little bit of shooting. And in this case, we're going to use a single auction army, first gen, in a real common caliber, 45 Colt, but in an unusual configuration, in a long flute variety. So let's see how she shoots. Does a number. Oh, I was just a little bit right on that one. <laughs> there we go. Let's see, maybe we can get one of those steel targets. Oh, I was a little high and right that time too. Well, that was fun. Before we head back now to the shop to look at some of these others, uh, you probably notice this old track loader here behind me. Now this is an old mining rig from around here from way back and actually did some logging too. Um, I doubt it was here for the opening of this mine back in the 30s because I think it's a little, little modern for that. But uh, it's been around a lot of the mines around here and probably worked it on the second opening. This one I've got a picture of somewhere that was working in a, a local uranium mine. 
So that gives it the added benefit that uh, it's a little easier to find in the dark. <laughs> Not really. Okay, so we're all done now. Let's head back to the shop and see if we can't show you some of the issues that might crop up with these old single action armies. So let's take a little closer look at these Colt single action armies and see what makes them tick. Or maybe more correctly, what makes them click. Now these are all first generations and I've got a variety of them here in all different calibers. Um, I don't have anything against the second generation or the third generation. I just don't have any to show you. Most people believe the second generation is, is really probably the, the highest quality just because the metallurgy is a lot better than um, quality's kind of gone somewhat downhill with the third generation and beyond. First generation, got to remember, you know, they were manufactured from 1873 to about 1940. So there's a, a vast difference in the metallurgy that was used in those. Now the quality of the workmanship was always good from, from, through that whole first generation span. But I would say that I, I think some of the late first generations are ever bit as high quality as, as those second gens. And of course, my wife's a collector, so I got to raid some of hers and she collects the first gens. And we've got a couple others here from a couple of family members who will want me to look them over. So anyway, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the Colt single action army four clicks. Now, I remember when my wife really started getting serious about these single action armies, we were at a gun show and, and she was looking at one and wanted me to come over and take a look at it. And so I come over and I, I remember picking it up and holding it up to my ear. And you see people doing this regularly at gun shows. There's one, two, three, four. Oh, four clicks. It must be okay. <laughs> Well, it's true, they all, all should have four clicks. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're okay if they do have four clicks. Now they can have a myriad of, of other problems um, that, that aren't gonna show up just by counting clicks. And so really what we're, we wanna to accomplish today is to show you some, some ways to evaluate, maybe at a gun show or if you're going to a gun store, uh, you know, quick and easy ways to evaluate some of the, the more major problems um, that can crop up with a, with a single action army Colt um, so that you can be a little more informed and don't make some of the mistakes that, that we made early on that resulted in some of the guns that are sitting on this table now. So stick around, we'll, we'll take uh, the cylinder out of this one and uh, kind of show you what those four clicks are all about. Okay, so here's this 45 Colt long flute that we were shooting in the intro. Um, they call it a long flute because these are a, were a leftover double action cylinder with a longer flute than the standard single action armies. They they were close enough dimensions to the single action army that they, they retrofitted some of them, cut in these cylinder notches and reused them in the in the single action armies about 1914 or so. So these they're pretty scarce variety here. So we're going to take the cylinder out of this one so we can see how it operates. We, we open the loading gate, put it on the load notch, depress the base pin latch, and pull out the base pin if it'll come out. Some of them are really tight. This one's not too bad. Okay, and then that cylinder will come right out. Now we, we can show you all what's going on with the three clicks. Now the first thing you ought to notice here is that the the uh, firing pin is sticking out through the frame here. So of course if we've got the, the gun loaded um, we certainly don't want that resting on a live cartridge. And of course we we typically always have it resting on a, an empty cylinder anyway but we can we can put that in what they call the the low or the safe notch then the firing pin is out of there. You should be able to pull the trigger and don't pull it real hard. We don't want to break anything, but it should not um, drop the hammer from that point. So this one's operating correctly. This this gun is is fully functional, so everything should be working properly. Okay, the next click we're going to hear is when we hit the load notch, and you'll notice too that when we did that, I'll do it again, that the bolt as Colt calls them, I think uh, Smith & Wesson calls them a cylinder stop. It drops just before we get to the load notch. Okay, so now it's it's down, so it's not stopping that cylinder from rotating. So now we can rotate the cylinder and load our cartridges. 
Okay, so we're gonna continue back and just before we get to the full cock, that bolt will come back up. Now, and as we're just finishing the rotation of the cylinder, then we hit the full cock notch, the bolt's up, it's rotated into place. You can just see here the top of the hand, which is attached to the, to the hammer and rotates upward, is pushed upward, and that's what rotates this cylinder as it's, it's hitting on this ratchet pad here and rotates the cylinder. So that's how it functions when everything's working properly. So let's see if we can't find a gun or two on this table that isn't operating properly. Okay, so let's take a little closer look at uh, some of these revolvers that have some issues. Now these first three are, are related to the hammer notches. The, this first one here is a 3220. It's uh, one of those really odd ones that doesn't have four clicks. So if we listen here, we get one, there it's in the safe notch. And then we go a long ways before we hear another click. And that's the bolt rising. And then the full cock. So this one doesn't have a load notch, which would make it really interesting to load. So you'd have to pull, pull back on the hammer into where about the load notch would be, flip up the gate and load this thing. Be, be a kind of a bugger. Now this one came from a, a state police trooper back in the 1940s. So I'm not sure if he carried that as a service revolver. That, that really wouldn't have been a real good strategic thing to, to have if you were in a, in a gunfight. The next one, this one's a really a cool gun. You see the inlays in the wooden stocks and um, it's just really slicked up. Kind of reminds me of a gunfighter's gun. But I don't know if it was in the process of slicking it up or what. They, they really messed up the hammer notches on this one. When we, when we go into the uh, safe notch, the, the uh, firing pin's protruding. The firing pin is actually flat across the face. And of course, we would like to see it rounded, more hemispherical design. Then we get into the load notch and we barely go back at all. We're in the load notch, but we haven't even pulled the bolt down yet. So the load, it goes into load notch before the bolt's down. So this is another one that's going to be a real bugger to load. We're going to have to pull it back a little bit more. Now the, the bolt's down and we can rotate the cylinder. So this one's really kind of a mess. Now the, the full cock notch works properly. Um, the bolt rises in the proper place, but those first two notches are, are a mess. And here we have our, our only Bisley and uh, nothing against Bisleys. I won't badmouth them, but I just really don't like the grip. I prefer the, the standard grip. But this one has kind of a similar problem in the um, safe notch where you just barely start to pull it back and, and it engages in the safe notch. So the firing pin hasn't even um, pulled back hardly at all, just a few thousands. And we can pull the trigger while it's in the safe notch. And that, that's another thing that was wrong with this one I, I forgot to mention, is while we're in the load notch, not that the load notch works, but we can pull the trigger as well. So you know, I want to test that in both the safe notch and the load notch, but don't pull it real hard. I mean, you can break off that little ear that holds them in there. So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to, we're going to take this uh, 38 Colt apart and look at this hammer and just see what those notches look like and see why it's not functioning the way it should. Okay, so we're going to take apart this this hot rotted slicked up gunfighter gun 38 Colt. And before we do, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, this one's been slicked up in the past. Um, it's really smooth. It's really kind of cool. But, you know, I don't really think it's a good idea to modify these single action these first gen single action armies you know the the even though they're they're pretty stiff um you know because of the collector value and whatnot keep them original uh, you know if you want to slick something up here's here's my carry gun this old uberti cattleman you know i've slicked it right up i mean it is just smooth as silk and and great to do that but don't do it. Even even some of these second generations now are beginning to be collectible enough. Um, I'd, I'd hesitate to, to slick those up. Okay, so let's take this thing apart. First off, we're going to take the grip frame off. First thing I always do is loosen up these these two on the on the back strap on the top here, and then that relieves a little bit. A lot of times, there's a lot of pressure on this bottom bottom screw on the grip strap. 
and if you don't loosen those others first um, you can have a bugger of a time getting this one out and you bugger up the head of the screw and whatnot so always just loosen those up a little bit and then I take this one completely out and that, that's always worked well for me and the same thing going back in I, I put them all in get them kind of just almost tight and then tighten that bottom one first and these top two second okay then that should just come right off of there sometimes they're a little tight nice thing about these single action armies you only need three screwdrivers and uh, to work on them so you're not you've got a lot of screws to take out but three of them work actually two would work but there's one of them that I like to have a, um, a, a different screwdriver head for and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a minute the uh, same one we took the back strap off we can take the this trigger guard off with there's three screws here in this trigger guard And these are pretty boogered up while I've got them out. I might clean these up just a little bit just because they're kind of ugly. This gun's been pretty well used over the years. And while we have that hammer out, we might just get really brave and weld it up and recut the notches. Okay, so oh, then that... Trigger guard. Oh, just got a couple more threads I didn't get out. There we go. Okay, so we can just set that upside down there. Now we're into the the one screw that that is really troublesome, and that's this this uh, bolt and trigger spring is held in by a screw that's it's pretty wide but it, they're very very shallow so it's really easy to booger the heads up on these so you really want to make sure you've got the proper screwdriver and really work hard at keeping that screwdriver in there good and flat and then that one come out pretty well sometimes they are really not a lot of fun so here's here's an issue now th this gun doesn't have this problem but this this bolt trigger spring um, they break pretty regularly. So, um, you know, if the trigger's just flopping in there without any um, tension or the bolt's not working properly, a good good possibility is that this, this spring has broken. Okay, so now we're going to get back into taking out the, the trigger and the bolt so we can get into that hammer. And we're going to use the same uh, screwdriver or head in this case that we did to take the back strap and the trigger guard off now these these screws are very very similar but because of the the um, receiver on this or the frame is tapered one's just a little bit longer than the other so this trigger the screw that holds the trigger in is just a little bit longer than the one that holds the bolt in So when you get them back, put them back together, if, if it doesn't look quite right, that's probably the problem. One's sticking out a little bit, one's not quite long enough. And here's, here's the bolt. This is what uh, raises up and locks that cylinder into place, times the cylinder. Okay, now we're down to the hammer. And it takes the same um, screwdriver head that we use to take the mainspring out. Okay, so the, now the hammer will come out and the hand should come with it. So this, this is the hand. Remember we talked a little bit about it was showing up just outside the frame window here um, where, where as the hammer rotates back that hand is pushed upward against the ratchet assembly here on the back of the the cylinder and that's what rotates the cylinder okay so if if this spring breaks and and it does happen from time to time then your hand doesn't function properly and your cylinder doesn't rotate properly 
Okay, so this uh, this hammer, I can see already part of the problem, but we'll we'll get a good one here to look at. You can see this the the uh, load notch is way been filed way back here. So we'll get another one we'll compare it to here real quick, get them set up where you can see the difference. Okay, so first let's take a look at how the hammer and trigger mechanism should work together when the, the uh, notches are cut in here properly. Of course, this is our, our safe notch here, our, our load notch here, and our full cock notch here. And it's a little harder to see. It's a smaller notch. Of course, then this is our trigger and the sear portion of the trigger here. So... If we're a hammer down position, we start to cock the hammer. The first thing we do is we get into that safe notch. And you can see that's captured now. Now I can't pull the trigger with, with that in the load notch. And that's the way it should be. As we continue to cock the hammer, then we drop into the load notch here. And we can't pull the trigger there either. And that's the way that should be. We continue to rotate. And we've got two clicks now. About here, we're going to get our third click. And that's a one that isn't from one of the notches, but from this bolt here and the tail of it's gonna ride over the hammer cam and right about here it slides over and we see that bolt ride up and that's click number three. And then we get into the full cock notch is of course the fourth and final click. Now the only thing that's not quite right about this one is in the full cock notch, we see if we, if we start to pull that trigger, we don't see the the hammer move at all. And we'd really like to see it rock back just a little bit. We call that positive sear engagement. And that's the safest way to have them ground. Okay, so let's compare that with this uh, hammer out of the 38 Colt that, that doesn't seem to be functioning right at all. Let's prop that up a little bit so we can get a better angle at it so you can see. Okay, so we see right off that the, the uh, safe notch here has been ground down quite a bit on the top. And it's just a little bit further back than the, than the factory ground one. So that's what's letting that um, firing pin protrude a little bit. And now we can see in the load notch, it's been ground way back. And it doesn't, it doesn't have that overhang that keeps the, the sear from disengaging. So we can pull the trigger while it's in the load notch. And it's so far down that the, uh, the, the bolt is, is still engaged in the cylinder. And we can't rotate the cylinder to load. Now the, the um, full cock notch is, is cut where it's supposed to be, and actually this one is a little bit positive. It's the only one that's cut properly. It does actually rock back just a little bit as we pull the trigger. Okay, now we've got a couple of guns that have good hammer notches, good four clicks, but they've got a couple of other issues that are fairly easy to identify. The first one we're going to look at is this really nice, really late generation, or really late first generation, 357 Magnum. And yes, they did make a few right at the end of production of the first generation. The 357 Magnum came out. Fortunately for us, the, the factory records are missing for, for the late first gens. But Colt did have a record of this one. The only thing that was in it was that it was a 357 Magnum. So we have that letter from, from Colt saying the only thing they have on this is that it was produced as a 357 Magnum. Now, the, the issue with this one is in the bolt timing. Now, the, the bolt has to be timed very precisely, and, and this one is, is way out of time. So let's take a little closer look at it, and it's really easy to identify once you know what you're looking at. Okay, so this bolt fits right into this notch in the cylinder, and that's what locks it into place when the cylinder's lined up with the barrel. We've got this little kind of a lead ramp, and when timed properly, that bolt's going to come up just on the lead edge of that ramp, and slide right down into that notch, locking it in place. Now, if, the, if it's timed too early, then we can watch that and, and kind of see right in here as we cock the gun where that bolt hits in relation to this uh, notch and this lead ramp. But this one's really easy because it's timed way too early. And if I get out of the light here a little bit, maybe you can see it better. But there's this real shiny spot right in here in front of the lead. And it's that way on, on each of the notches all the way around the cylinder. So we know that this bolt is timed way too early. It's, it's coming up clear up here when it really should be, if it's timed properly, coming right in, in this area here. That's not really a hard fix for a gunsmith that knows revolvers. Okay, and lastly, we've got this beautifully engraved 
Frontier Six Shooter in 4440 that indexes beautifully, has four good clicks, hammer seems to be in great shape, times up perfectly, but this thing has all sorts of cylinder fit problems. So let's take a little closer look at how we identify those. Okay, so the first thing we want to check when we're checking the cylinder fit on a revolver is end shake. And that's how far forward and back the cylinder can move within the frame. And we really want that to be either non-existent or just barely any, any movement at all. Now, if we look at this one, we can see we've got a lot of movement. We want zero to maybe as much as two thousandths of an inch in play. This one has all sorts of in play. So if we take a feeler gauge, the easiest way to check that, we'll uh, take that cylinder, move it all the way forward, and we're going to measure that barrel cylinder gap. We can just get, this one's a nine thousandths feeler gauge in there. Now we're going to push it all the way back. And the difference between the two is our end shake. So here's a 24 thousandths. And it's actually a little bit loose. Um, probably could get a 25 thousandths in there. So we've got at least 15 thousandths end shake. And that's just way out of spec. Um, that's not, not a gun that we really want to shoot. The problem with end shake is once you start developing end shake, the more you shoot it, the worse it gets. Because it's just beating the heck out of things in there. And what it's really beating up is this cylinder bushing here now this is out of that 357 magnum gun and and uh that cylinder bushing up on the front here now as it's beaten back and forth it's flattening that out pushing it back some so a, a gunsmith can actually stretch this cylinder bushing a little bit and i won't describe how to do it because uh it's a it's a little touchy to be able to do but the easier thing is is to to buy another cylinder bushing and just fit it to the gun so what that's going to do is if if we've added material or stretched this then that's going to push that cylinder back and and take that end shake out okay so so we've solved one problem if we if we stretch that um cylinder bushing or we uh put a new one in and fit it properly. So that's going to push this thing all the way back. And that brings us to our next test. We're going to test for headspace. Now testing for headspace in a revolver is far, far easier than it is on a rifle. Here's a, a no-go uh, headspace gauge for the Brownell cells. And so with, with it pushed all the way back, if we've corrected the, the end shake, then it shouldn't go. And this one doesn't go. Okay, now if I, with all that end shake in there, if I put that in the sheet, it's loose as a goose that way. Now, first of all, we've got to pull that hammer back a little bit before we do that test, and I did to get the uh, firing pin out of the way. Now, here's a go gauge. So this one's 60 thousandths. It should go in there, and it does. And it's actually um, pretty close there. So, so we know that with this... Um, cylinder bushing fitted in properly our headspace is going to be okay on this one whereas now it's 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 a problem because of the, that can run back and forth so we've we've fixed the end shake and we've fixed the headspace problem by fitting a new cylinder bushing but now we've created a monster and remember when when i put that 24 thousandths feeler gauge in here for the barrel cylinder gap so we've got a barrel cylinder gap that should be about six to eight thousandths of an inch, and we're at 24 thousandths now. Now this is a big problem. Now to correct barrel cylinder gap, what we have to do is we remove this barrel, then we put, take it over, put it on the lathe, and then we turn another thread onto the barrel threads as it threads into the receiver, and then we have to cut the end of the barrel and, and recut the forcing cone and the whole nine yards. We actually have to um, shorten up the ejector housing. So it's a big job. And what it does is it, on a collectible gun, now the barrel's just a little bit too short. And, it, and it's not much. I mean, these these first gens are 20 threads to, to the inch, so it's going to be now 50 thousandths too short. But it's going to be too short. So we really have to make a decision on a collectible gun whether you want it to be in firing condition or you want to leave it in, in collector condition, um, 
and and that's a tough one i mean i obviously i like to shoot them um but then again we're gonna we're gonna hurt the collector value of a gun um by shortening up that barrel like we do now the other end of the spectrum on this barrel cylinder gap is this 357 magnum and i didn't realize it till i took it apart for this episode but the gap's too tight on this one looking at the front of the cylinder i can see all the bluings wore off here where the barrel and the front of the cylinder have been rubbing against each other now there's not enough end shake in this one to to move it back to to uh, get in spec so what we would have to do is either take the barrel off take it over to the lathe and and trim just a little bit off of the back of the barrel or brownells actually makes a a uh, a cutter that that you can do it in the gun unfortunately they're back ordered right now and they just have a shaft that goes down through the barrel and, and attaches to the cutter and we can by hand shave that back of that barrel and get it back into spec now since this is the wife's gun and, and it needs repaired when i put that that tool on my christmas list when it gets back in stock and it'll get moved right up to the top of the list so that works out really good when when wife's guns need repaired i get some new tools out of the deal <laughs> So anyway, we've, we've gone over several of the basic things to look for that are really simple once you understand what you're looking for with these single action armies. And really, it's, it's very similar on, on most all um, uh, single action revolvers, whether it be Ruger or, or some of the other brands. The specs might be a little bit different, just look those up. But So we know now what the, what the four clicks mean, what it should look like when they're, when they're in the right place and, and how things should index up. Um, with the hammer notches if they're if they're cut improperly and way out like some of these are it's fairly obvious okay so we've also looked at uh, bolt timing and where that bolt should be be uh, coming up into the cylinder um, we've looked at the cylinder fit and and so in terms of really important one that end shake you know if you can just by hand move that back and forth quite a little bit it's pretty obvious you know with zero to two thousandths end shake that thing should just barely move to still be in spec we've looked again at uh, headspace and there's these cheap little deals from brownells that you can check headspace with or a feeler gauge you just have to put a whole lot of them together and and then we've looked at a really important one that barrel cylinder gap and again we're just talking about a feeler gauge um, so if you go to a gun show gun shop you got your feeler gauge um, you got a, a pair of glasses um, maybe some go no go gauges um, you've got what it takes now to to really evaluate the the basics of the mechanical function of a single action army well before we sign off we're gonna have to get a little practice in you never know when we're gonna have to guard that next mercury shipment or maybe the payroll for the mine uh oh Try that one again. Oh, there we go. So if anybody opens this mine up again, maybe they'll have a little lead to mine along with the cinnabar. Well, thanks for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Until next time, happy trails from the cinnabar.